are now live. Hi. I'm live here. Who is still awake on a Sunday evening? Ooh. Most of you won't have work, I'm, I'm imagining. I just got a text from my dad. <laughs> Sorry for reading the bell. Hi. Hi, Lee's at best. Lisa, Lisa best, Lee's at best. <laughs> Hi guys, where are we? Where are we right now? Where are you? Tell me where you're watching from. You're watching from the UK. You're watching from bed in Costa Rica. Where are you at? Where are you at? Tell me. Hi dad. Um, ask me questions. Ask me questions. Ask me questions. We just had some good questions on the virtue method. Uh, Rose Bay. Yes. <laughs> New York. Oh, I miss New York so much. You know what I'm saying? I feel like, I feel like there's a part of New York inside me when I walk around. I love London, but London's very polite. Whereas New York has this vibe of like, it's like everyone just, I don't know. I feel like people say what they feel more <laughs> in New York and they say what they feel more. Whereas in London, people are holding that shit in, but they, are thinking the same thing. <laughs> Scotland, yes, yes. Saudi Arabia, I haven't been. Um, France, France, bonjour. Ça va? Please say, hi Shona, please. Oh, please Shona, do you track macros? No, I don't track macros. However, I have had an awareness of macronutrient value, more so just protein, to be honest, um, for a very, very, very long time. So I kind of know now what my body needs. I'm not against macro tracking. I'm not against calorie tracking. It works for some people and it works in a non-obsessive way for some people. Um, but I still think the goal should always be towards being able to not have to rely on that kind of system um, because it isn't healthy long-term to be constantly needing to have like a hyper awareness around that. I don't count anything now. Um, but I do have a very, I guess, strong connection to my body, my body's needs. Um, but I also really value like eating foods that give me a lot of pleasure, more pleasure than, you know, having a protein with my salad or something like that. So that was a long way to answer that. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't count my macros. Hey, Shona, my name, my name is Shona. We have such a beautiful name. We do have a beautiful name. I agree. Shona is a beautiful name. Um, all right, I've got questions. Oh, here we go. Question. Mobility program tomorrow. Yes. How do I, why isn't it going there? Yes. Yes. Mobility program tomorrow. Mobility program tomorrow. Yes. Uh, you will be getting it back at seven. You will be getting it at 7 PM. The website goes live. So 7 p.m. if you're in the UK, Greenwich Mean Time, whoever is on GMT will be getting it then. Uh, obviously, if you're in Europe, it's an hour later than that, isn't it? I think, I think. So then you'll be getting it at 8 p.m. Um, and then I don't know all the other times, I'm afraid. <laughs> Not off the top of my head. So that is when it will be out, okay? Uh, drop your questions in this thing. So you just have to look at the bottom of the screen. Oh, I just saw another one pop up. So I'm gonna go answer that, okay? Um, cause it's hard for me to read questions in the, there, in the comments that, that pop up. Um, have I ever had a job out? Oh, I saw this one. Have I ever had a job outside of fitness and how did I keep up with my training when I did? Yeah, I did. I worked in an office fam. So when I was 19, uni, I went to uni for a year to do psychology and I didn't finish the degree because I just felt a bit immature for it at the time. I had like financial issues. I just couldn't get through the degree. I was, had so much stress around the outside of my life, which is why I want to go back to do it now. When I quit uni, I was like, I need money. <laughs> so I went and got a job and I worked in an office. And when I worked in an office, I really came to terms with what it is to be behind a desk for nine hours a day. I really came to understand what is happening and what happens to your body, what happens to your brain, the lack of drive to train, to exercise, because it's so much easier to just sort of like stay in your, at your desk and work and work through the lunch break and sit. 
And it's just really like, there's not much you can do. I understand what it's like to have, you know, your whole team there and have your boss there. That's kind of like, how dare you take a break to go and train? Um, but you're also tired. You can't train in the morning, you're trying to do it in the evening. So I totally understand and can relate to why it's difficult. I drew on that knowledge and understanding, having lived it firsthand when I created the virtue method, um, because I was like, right, get your workouts done at home. If you cannot get to a gym um, and you cannot take a lunch break and do things like that, I was like, then we're doing it at home. We're doing it together. Yeah, so that's a big part of why I actually created it. All right, hang on. We've got a lot of questions coming through here. Can I? <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, yes. I can bring back the merch. It is coming, guys. It's just we just had some. They. So I didn't manage to get all the designs finalized before Christmas. Uh, before the Christmas order or the pre-Christmas order uh, or before the January order. And then these guys close um, in Feb, I think. And so, no, they close in Jan and then that they reopen in Feb, which means we can't get it until March. Okay. So it's coming. Like it's, it's there, right? It's there. March, 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 March. All right. Next question. How do I do this? How do I just get questions back? All right. Virtue method structure around an evening BJJ training. Ah, yes. That's tricky because like evening, if you're including like sparring in that, it can be tricky. If you're talking about the virtue method mobility program, that's a totally different thing. So you'll be able to do that actually really easily Um, because there's only, so the way this, the mobility program is structured is that you have um, a daily mobility routine. So I would recommend you do that every morning. Um, or you can do that in the evening. It doesn't matter either or, but I, if you're doing evening BJJ classes, I'd probably do it in the morning or you could do it before you go to BJJ, which would be also really beneficial for your body. Anyway, so there's that. And then you've got, it's divided into months, month one, two, and three. And so month one, we'll have an upper body and a lower body sequence. And we stick on that sequence for a whole four weeks before adapting and moving to the next month two and then month three. So you'll have to figure out the best. I don't know how many days a week you're going to BJJ, but I would try and do the mobility after BJJ, like the, the upper body or the lower body. You could do it after, um, you could do it before. It really just depends on how many days a week you're doing BJJ. Um, if you're talking about the fitness program, that might be a little bit trickier, but I would make sure that you do the fitness program probably on the off days, or you could do them in the mornings and then still go to BJJ in the evenings. And that's what I do. I train uh, BJJ in the evening and I do my weight training and my circuit training in the morning. Okay. Alrighty. Are there any questions I'm missing down in the, why am I so shit? Okay. Let's hang on. Here we go. Huh? Huh? Hang on. I'm trying to answer your questions like both ways. So some of you are putting questions there. Um, it's so much easier though to answer questions in the, the question thingy. So I'm just going to do that. But hi, 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 what up? What up? I'm seeing all the hellos and things. And I've I, like my codependence, my people please. He's like, oh my God, I want to tend to all of it. Okay, let's go. Next question. Mm-hmm. This is a good question. All right. Do I eat plant-based? I get confused these days. I feel like an old person. It's like, what, what does plant-based mean anymore? Like these days I'm like, are you, are you avoid, is plant-based because you want to still wear leather? <laughs> so you say plant-based because you're like, <laughs> I don't, I, I still want to own like fancy bags and uh, fancy clothes, but I don't want to eat me. So I'm, I don't know. I just don't know what plant-based is supposed to mean. This is saying I'm vegan or vegetarian, but I think it's that, right? Um, or it's like some days you eat meat, like you're plant based, but sometimes you eat meat. Um, so that is where I'm at. So I basically am mostly plant based. I mostly eat vegetarian meals. However, around my menstrual cycle, I will have uh, meat. So whether that's chicken um, or if it's if I'm feeling particularly anemic, um, which I do get if I go fully plant based or am fully even just vegetarian. I'm sorry. The reason I'm looking at this book is because there's a whole section where I tell the story and I was just going to hold it up to the camera, but I, I can't find it. Anyway, it's, I talk about it in this book and I tell my story with veganism and, and vegetarianism and the reason that I started. And then the reason that I stopped the reason I started, it was very, it was purely an ethical decision. I had nothing to do with health guys. Can I just say choosing to go vegan is not going to be the most healthiest choice you ever make. 
okay? It's not. It's just not because as our human bodies didn't evolve for that. We can argue as much as you would like, but the data that we have, the scientific data we have is never going, well, it's not that it's never going to support it, but currently it doesn't support veganism, okay? Not if we're looking at it objectively. So, and that's how all data should be looked at. Anyway, but on an ethical Ethical arguments around veganism are flawless. They're flawless, okay? You cannot say that another life is more or less important than your own, okay? We have to acknowledge that life on planet Earth is equal. If we're going to progress um, in our compassion, in our... It's, anyway, I do think that one day we'll probably look back on eating meat the way that we're... Or at least the way that we enslave animals particularly a certain type of animal, we will probably look back on it and, and look at it the way that we look at slavery today. Um, but even slavery isn't completely abolished, right, in, in all over the world. It's just not. Uh, and it's sad and it's illegal, but it doesn't mean that it is completely abolished. So I do think that we'll look back on it one day and go, that was barbaric. Um, but until then, and until we have the technical advances to be able to really continue to live in a healthy way, then I think that it's probably... Yeah, it's probably not, we can't say that it's health, the healthiest way to live as a human being. But ethically, as I said, it is absolutely a flawless argument. And I would love, 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 love. And I will go back to veganism at some point. Or vegetarianism, sorry. Vegetarianism I will go back to. Because actually, there's an argument for... Oh, God, I'm not even going to get into this. Okay, another time I will get into it. But yes, I eat a lot of friggin' vegetables because I love it. You know what I say? I always say that you should eat like a vegan and then add your protein <laughs> that you would like. Um, and by the way, you can get enough protein on a vegan diet. It's not the protein that I said that. It's the B12. Yes, you can take supplements. Um, but for me, I did a lot of damage uh, to my body when I was vegan um, that really just makes veganism very, very difficult for me to go back to, even vegetarianism. So I still have to take a lot of supplements um, when I do something like that. It's just, A, it's expensive. It's also, it's not something I can talk about because I can't just be like, hey guys, like live my plant-based life and make sure you buy this supplement and this supplement and this supplement and this supplement to make sure that you're accommodating for the vitamin D, the vitamin, uh, the B12 deficiency you're going to have and the iron deficiency you're potentially going to have and how that's going to affect your iron levels and anemia and all. Oh, and this might happen on top of that if you get anemia from this. So then have this. It's like, that's just not, you know, somewhat like me who has a profile, who's trying to accommodate for as many people as possible in the advice I give, I want to make fitness and health accessible, is very difficult for me to be like, just be freaking vegan, right? It's just not. And I can't even do it. So, sorry, I got triggered. <laughs> All right, let's go back to some questions. <laughs> Don't ask me one of those questions. It's very difficult to answer, like black and white. Okay, okay. Oh, why did I start working out? This is a good one. Let's let's keep it. Let's go back to nice, simple, <laughs> simple, calm Shona. Alrighty. Why did I start working out? I was a gymnast. Uh, my parents enrolled me into a gymnastics program called Jumping Jelly Babies when I was three years old. I got pulled from that and put into the elite training program because they saw potential. And I then became a gymnast and was an elite gymnast for so uh, until I was. I'm not going to count the math. <laughs> the years until I was um, 12 and then I pulled out of the, pro the elite program because my dad I was training at that point like 24 hours a week basically and so my dad was like do you want life or do you want to have a childhood and I was kind of like I think I want childhood so I then went down to a different level of gymnastics training kept up gymnastics training for a while but it's very difficult to go from training you know over 20 hours a week to then training much much less and with a less competitive uh, aspect, I was training at state level rather than more international level. And I was just like, I just don't, this isn't for me anymore. And I lost the passion. I went to a performing arts high school and got into dance. And then I was a dancer. And so that was the reason that I started sort of exercise and movement. Now, in terms of working out with like in a gym, that was much, much later. So that was probably when I was around 17, 18. Actually, no, my dad started taking me to the gym. I didn't know what I was doing. I just went on the cardio machines. <laughs> and then I'd go down to the front room where all the dumbbells were. And I'd be like, <laughs> I'd do a bit of this. 
because I just didn't, I mean, I just had no clue. So, um, I, that was when I was probably about 16. My dad was like, using all your gymnastic strength, let's go to the gym. So he'd make me go to the gym at like six in the morning before school. Um, and yeah, so that was not a great time in my life. I hated it. You're a teenager. You, know, you just want to sleep in. Anyway, then I started working out in the gym because I had a boyfriend at the time who was a personal trainer and he actually taught me a lot. And I was very, very lucky to learn a lot from him. Um, and he helped me to become aware of how underactive my glutes were, which were causing these chronic back pain, this chronic back pain that I was getting for a long time post quitting gymnastics. And unfortunately, I was kind of directed towards yoga for fixing that. So I, kept, I was like, okay, I need to up my yoga, up my yoga, up my yoga, up my flexibility because I'm so stiff. I'm stiffer than I was when I was a gymnast. But it wasn't that. It was that I'd lost the strength that I had when I was a gymnast. And so my passive range was really big. My active range of motion was getting smaller and smaller by the day, which really meant that I was super, super flexible but had no strength to support it. So I started lifting weight. And that was when I was about, what, like 18, 19? And I'm 32 now! Oh, shit! Shit! All right, okay, let's scroll down, let's scroll down. Okay, here we go. I don't know what this question says because I can't read the whole thing. Damn it, I can't read them when they're really long. I find the pace super, okay, I'm gonna assume that you're saying I find the pace super challenging. This is a really good question. Okay, so the pace is challenging, yes, but remember that I say things like, you can pause the video, right? Pause it as you need to. Um, Another thing I will say is that if you're finding the pace really challenging, the reason that I had to move relatively quickly is because I wanted to accommodate for the fact that you're going to adapt and you're going to like particularly beginners. You guys are going to adapt quickly. That's the, the beginners. That's the best part of being a beginner is that your body has there's this phenomenon that like your gains happen at such a faster and higher rate when you're starting out. And then as you get more trained, they it, it sort of like peaks off. Yeah. So you just end up with this sort of slow, very slow gains, but that's a great time. So what I didn't want was that it really only catered to the very beginning of your journey. And then you're sort of going, okay, Shona, like, hurry up. I can get through this now. Remember you're repeating this program, not just for 12 weeks, but for 24 weeks, you're going to come back to it and you're going to increase your weight. You're going to increase maybe the reps that you're doing. So just remember that I had to accommodate for that adaptation, which will happen quickly. So if you're struggling with the pace, like watch the video before you do the program. So like, as in try to watch the warm up only, try to learn that, do that warm up, pause as you need to kind of get to know and understand what you're doing. I promise, I promise it will get easier. You just said, I started your program today. Like you are going to see huge improvements. If you just stick with it, acknowledge that the pace is going to be a bit tricky in the beginning. That's always the way. I promise it will become a lot easier over time. Yeah. So just stick with it. Use the pause button, repeat workouts, repeat weeks. Don't feel like you have to like move at the pace that I'm moving again. It is accommodating for the adaptations that will happen, that will happen at a faster rate as you go on. Okay, cool. All right, what am I missing down in the lower comments? What am I missing down here? Okay, okay. Hi, Shona. Thoughts on Bikram? Oh, God, I haven't talked about that yet, have I? Homeowners can be used for beginners because I'm really worried about my form. Yes, it can be used for beginners, absolutely. Um, please, slowly talking. Sorry, I talk really fast, don't I? Sorry. I'll talk slower. I'll talk the way that I talk in <laughs> French, which is very, very slow. <laughs> okay. Mm -mm -mm. Anyway, it's a very personal decision. Plus with the flavor of meat, that was the reason to become vegan in the first place. Ah, okay. You're talking about veganism. Okay. Don't get me started on veganism again. <laughs> I feel way better from my stomach. Great. Guys, if you feel good doing veganism, um, then absolutely, what you what up? Um, then absolutely do it, but just pay attention because I felt great when I started it too. And I'm not talking anyone out of veganism because, again, from an ethical point of view, there are no arguments. There are no arguments unless you think that human beings are the highest, um, the supreme being. In which case, just we don't, we're not unpacking that because <laughs> we're definitely not. Um, but yes, so you know. That's totally your decision. 
pay attention though, because these, these symptoms can come up slowly. Um, and if you're, yeah, I just, anyway, we're not talking about this because it's going to take some opinion. Oh, 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 oh. Thank you for asking this question. <laughs> oh shit. Let me unpack this. Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay. I need a moment. <laughs> okay. I have a few things to say about this. And don't worry, I'm not criticizing anyone for actually doing cosmetic procedures, by the way. Like, it is your body. It is your prerogative. I have two issues. Two main issues. And feel free to disagree with me, by the way. Because I, I've had arguments with my friends about this. And not, and not heated arguments. We just are like, oh yeah, oh, it's tricky to come to a decision on this. Okay? So please tell me, like, comment and let me know what you think. <laughs> if you have a profile, okay, if you have a profile on Instagram or, um, a, you know, a media profile, I don't think that you should. So the problem that I have with people being honest about the work that they have done. So like, let's say they've had their lips done or they've had fillers or things like that on their face. The issue that I have is when they talk about doing it and say like, I get my lips done every week or I don't know. I don't know what the procedure is every month or whatever. And they have a following that's predominantly, you know, young girls. My problem, my problem is that you're making it okay and you're making it, you're normalizing it. And the issue I have with normalizing it is that um, I don't think that young girls should necessarily feel obligated or influenced in any way to do that. I think that if you have a profile, you have a responsibility. The other side to that argument is that people say, yes, but their authenticity is important because maybe they're selling, um, you know, a beauty cream, a vitamin C cream, you know, they're doing influencing work and they're saying like, buy this vitamin C cream. And they've had so much work done on their face cosmetically. It's leading people into thinking that this vitamin C cream is going to do what's been done to their face. So I do, I do recognize, and this is the argument that I have with my girlfriends where I'm like, yeah, but I don't think, I, I still think that it's making it too it, okay. Next thing you know, you're going to have, and we do, not even next thing. We have like 16 year old girls like saving up money to be able to get their lips done. What the fuck? Sorry, it's fucked. Um, and so the other issue I have with this is that we're not questioning the beauty standard enough. And, and, and we are, and I think there are big progressions there, but there's still so much that women feel obligated to do, a social cultural obligation to do, just to be accepted in society. And I'm not even talking about cosmetic procedures like surgery or anything that's like painful. I'm just talking about like how much makeup, how much women spend on makeup. How much women spend on, you know, getting their hair done versus men versus men here. Okay. And you could argue that men aren't pressuring us into doing that. And they're not necessarily actually, I think now misogyny and the misogynistic aspects of the beauty standard are actually perpetuated more by women. So this whole bullshit argument of like constantly beating up on men, I think isn't fair. It's not fair. It's annoying because men don't care about it enough. Um, but whatever, that's another thing. But I think that we can't disregard the fact that women are perpetuating the misogyny. So we have to then, okay, if we acknowledge that there is misogyny still being perpetuated by women via or via, depending on what you say, the beauty standard and these beauty cosmetic procedures, right? Trying to look in a way that, that accommodates for the male gaze, then we need to say, okay, well, where is my own internalized misogyny manifesting in society? Like, where is it manifesting in my own practices? And we have to take that responsibility to ourselves and our actions if we want to facilitate change. Where do you draw the line, though? Like, where do you draw the line? I don't, I don't wear makeup, but I do every now and then get lashes put on. I still, <laughs> like, really like a hairless body on myself. 
So I will still shave my armpits. I still shave my legs. I still get a Brazilian laser treatment done. You know, it's like, I still do those things. So am I being hypocritical to a degree? Because it's like, actually, should I just be all natural? You know, I'm still adhering to some of the social uh, conditioning that I've been subject to growing up. So I don't know where to draw the line. My opinion on cosmetic procedures is that I would really love it if like all of us women just got together and were like, do you know what? Like, let's, um, let's just not force ourselves to do these sorts of things. Like, let's just chill a bit. But you know, it's like, then I, people throw the argument back at me. It's like, that's easy for you to say you have clear skin or you have, I don't know. I don't think I have lips, but anyway, whatever. You know what I mean? So it's like, I, it's, it's not something that I necessarily feel like I don't want to, I'm not attacked women on this I just I don't know what the I don't know I don't know what do you guys think can I I'm gonna scroll through some of your comments thanks for asking that question Poppy but yeah I, there's a lot of girls at the moment actually there's a, there's a yoga teacher that I follow I'm not gonna say her name but I was so disappointed in her she's a very young following she has a very sexual page as well um, but you could argue whether that's sexual liberation or just objectification. Again, how do you know? How do you determine the difference? Like people, when you say like, that's self-objectification, they'll be like, no, it's sexual liberation. <laughs> so it's like, fuck, I don't know. Where do you, it's like all kind of gray, right? And it's all very subjective. Um, but she also did a video about like her lips getting done. And I was just like, no, you have like 16 year old girls following you. You have like a ma majority of young audience like this pain this breaks my heart like fine when you're 50 but then even then it's like oh god why do we feel like we have to really not age like what the fuck anyway sorry <laughs> i get really really upset about it yes i think there's already so much that influences how we feel about the way we look at that having a platform profile that easily encourages women to further feel uncomfortable with who they are yes yes hey danny kaloran danny kaloran <laughs> yes Exactly. I agree. Uh, 100% awful how it happens to girls and boys early on. They can use their own, lose their own personality and styles before they've really found it because they have to go with the norm. Yes. Another great, another great point made by you guys. Um, uh, man, I'm going to love like going through these comments. I totally agree with you. Young girls do not need even more misinformation as we women shouldn't be ob uh, obligated to do anything. And they shouldn't normalize it. Yeah. And I think we can't ignore the fact that you know men are, are under a lot of pressure now too as well so this beauty standard and this beauty myth is not just affecting women but it has been for a very long time and it probably will continue to do so but men are under you know different kinds of pressures I was actually talking to my good friend Beck Chambers yesterday you should follow her if you don't um, but we were talking about the fact that as much as this this situation we have with the patriarchy and the imbalance that it's created has also affected men in a bad way as well like when we talk about toxic masculinity by the way for any watching when when people talk about toxic masculinity it's actually not about saying to men like fuck you and your toxic masculinity it's actually about saying guys eradicate your toxic masculinity because it's actually it's a you're a prisoner to it like i can't beck made this point yesterday like imagine being told that you're the emotion that you're having needs to be suppressed because you are not a man if you allow it to surface. So imagine being told, no, you're not allowed to fucking cry. Hold that shit back, push it down somewhere. I can't, I can't even imagine. I cry whenever I need to and it feels amazing to get that release. Yeah, I don't feel like <gasps> gotta stop myself from crying. And I cannot imagine what it must be like for a man to feel like he is not allowed to have that emotion. Imagine the guilt that comes off the back of that. And it's the shame and the guilt for our emotions that is where the problem lies, right? It's not, it's not the emotion itself. Like we're all going to have good and bad days. We're all going to feel shitty at some point. It's not the shitty feeling that is necessarily bad. It's the stuff around it where we, we blame it or we feel shame around that shitty feeling or we feel guilty for that shitty feeling. That is the problem. That's the real problem area because that's the stuff that pushes it down even further. That means we have to behave, you know, inauthentically and that inauthenticity leads to more inauthenticity, which leads to more suppression. Anyway, this is a whole, you know, it's, whew, ah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> that was a good question. I get so triggered by those questions. <laughs> Alrighty. Okay, 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 okay. 
Oh, this is a good question. Okay, let's go to this. Do you think that stress could be a good reason for not losing weight? Yes, it could be a very good reason for not losing weight. Um, but don't, we, we can't neglect the fact that um, energy balance is the primary uh, sort of reasoning behind weight gain or weight loss. <clears throat> so what happens when you're stressed is that it can affect uh, things as simple as like your hunger signals. And if that's happening, then that means maybe your intake is slightly higher in terms of calories. For other people, it means their intake is lower when they're stressed. So it will be still based around uh, energy balance. And that's something worth paying attention to. Well, uh, actually, no, like, let me take that sentence back. It's not something worth paying attention to. It's worth acknowledging that if you're in a stress state, the last thing you want to be probably doing is counting calories. So um, if you're stressed, I would try to deal with the stress if it's mental or emotional, which it sounds like it might be. I'm just making an assumption here. Um, then I would highly encourage dealing with that first. Because that's going to really affect your mental health is so, uh, so, so, so much more important than your than your weight, unless you're, you know, in a really, really, really sick state with your weight. But I can even then your mental health will be worth addressing. It's probably what's what's led to that uh, that particular state. So, um, yeah, even if it's very underweight as well, same thing happens like. You can keep trying to address the the science around and it or not the science but but the concept of energy balance but if there's things that are affecting your behavior uh particularly subconscious things that are affecting your behavior then it's going to be very very difficult um to to make any behavioral changes which are impacting your caloric intake and your energy balance okay um yes yeah, someone just said water probably yeah fluid retention like can cause you know, I mean, there are so many different elements that could be causing it, but definitely energy balance can't be overlooked. So I just don't want you to be thinking like, oh, if I'm super stressed, it means that thermodynamics doesn't play a part because that can commonly happen. Okay. Uh, how does, oh, I don't know what that, that question is. How old am I? I am 32. Do I use a squat belt? I actually don't, but I just ordered one because I've started lifting at base gym. So, um, so yes, I will be soon. Sorry, I'm a bit, I'm gonna, do I eat carbs? I had another question there that was, do I eat carbs? Yes, I love carbs in and around my mouth. How does the online content work with the book? I don't, oh, you mean, okay, you mean you have the book, you have this, and then you, and then you wanna know how to <clears throat> work the Virtue Method online program? Okay, they're totally different programs. They're totally different programs. This is a month. This is a month training program. There's an advanced and there's a beginner variation. The workouts are actually on YouTube. The beginner ones, not the advanced. So the beginner ones are on YouTube. You can access them. Just type in VM Workout 1 or VM Workout 2 and you can access those even if you don't have the book um, because I wanted people to be able to try the workouts. Um, but essentially, it's a totally different program. Different goals, different pace. Um, this is amazing. This is really, really good. Uh, it's not, I was going to say it's an entry level, but it's, it's not even that it's just a good entry level. Like it's just a good program. Um, probably the focus was more around foundational movements, um, and understanding how to blend like more mobility in with, um, with your weight training. It was still about based on training at home because I wanted to make fitness and health more accessible. Like that's always been my goal from the beginning. It's health and fitness more accessible. So you wouldn't align the book and the and the uh, online program at all. Okay? You wouldn't. They're just not done together. Mobility program, however, could be done next to the book. And that comes out tomorrow, which I'm so excited about. All right, I'm going to take one more question. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? <laughs> Advice for BJJ beginners. So nervous to start. Okay. I'm going to give you a quote from Zig Ziglar. You don't have to be great to start, but you do have to start to be great. How's that? Huh? How is that? So advice for BJJ beginners, nervous to start. I mean, this applies to anything outside of BJJ. But BJJ is, uh, yes, BJJ is the best. Just saw a comment through there. You have to remember that you're going to be shit. Like just go in there and acknowledge that. You're going to be shit. It's going to be uncomfortable. You're going to roll with 
sweaty men. You're going to roll with um, sweaty women. You're going to have heavy people sit on top of you. You're going to sit on people. You're going to get very, 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 very up close with other human beings. And I think that that's actually very important. I think we have a primal uh, need almost to um, release our aggression. And I think that's a really grappling is a really good way to do it because it's in a controlled environment. You learn particular techniques, you tap before it becomes dangerous. The difference there is like in a striking martial art. Yes, it can be a release, but the thing I don't like about striking is that there's no tap out. <laughs> so anyway, that's a whole other thing. So in terms of um, feeling nervous to start, there's a few things that I would say. I would say have a read of the rules um, with BJJ before you go in. Not the, not the rules of doing BJJ. Well, that will help too, but have a, have a read of like the dojo rules. So things like, you know, not stepping onto the mat with uh, your shoes. That's a simple one. Um, but making sure that you bring sandals, not stepping onto the floor barefoot and then coming back onto the mat, making sure your nails aren't too long. Things like that are really beneficial to know before you begin so that you don't step out of line um because that can sometimes make you feel more nervous when you're sort of like oh god i don't know what i'm doing and there's so many rules and like i don't want to be the beginner that like fucks it up um so i would definitely make sure you pay attention to those and just out of respect as well um the other thing that i would recommend doing is like if you feel really really uncomfortable go to the women's class more self-defense based but also you feel more comfortable probably around women um it usually is where usually actually to, no that's i'm not even going to say that because i was going to say that it's usually where beginners go but it's not like you know i enjoy going to the women's role as well and i'm still a beginner but like i've rolled in beginners roles with like brown belts black belts purple belts so it's not it, it's not that like only beginners go to the women's role um it's really beneficial at times as well if you're ever thinking about competing to go to women's role because they're more who you're going to com like compete against so um for starting, I would just highly recommend that you go in there with an open mind, making sure that you acknowledge that you're going to be bad at it. And then if you're good and you're naturally good, it's a bonus. But just go in with the expectation that it's going to be very, very complicated, very, very tricky. Your first role is very, very, very important. Um, so make sure you make that, make your professor aware of it. Make sure you make anyone that you roll with aware of the fact, like, just say, like, I'm, I'm super new. I'm so, you know, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing here. Can you help me? Can we go slow? Any of that sort of stuff. Just be really vocal about that. Everyone in there was new at some stage. There is no one in there that's going to be like, oh, you're new. So it's just, no matter how uncomfortable you're feeling about being new, just know that everyone in there knows how it feels. So rest in the fact that they will rest in knowing that people will be accommodating for that and if they're not they're dicks and um they're one in a million trust me because in bjj most people are kind and caring and open and yes there are some dicks but that's just to be expected um so i hope that gave you some some advice Alrighty, everyone is bad at it yeah um i just joined Yes, I was talking about jiu-jitsu. Do I miss gymnastics? Okay, I'm going to start answering some of the questions down here. Do you miss gymnastics? Um, I started I'm balancing with yoga. And, uh, hang on. I just started and I'm balancing it with yoga and weightlifting. Amazing. Yeah, I miss gymnastics all the time. I was actually thinking about going back. There's a class in Mon on Monday. There's adult classes on Monday evening at Sydney Olympic Park. Uh, and... I was thinking about going back to do that. It's not actually a class, it's just like an open floor. But I just, it's, I find it really difficult to go back to gymnastics and be shit at it because I was very good at it. And so I find it really <laughs> confronting for my ego, <laughs> which is really bad because I am fine with being shit at jujitsu. I'm fine with being shit at other things. But when I go back to gymnastics, it like really pains me. It really pains me to be shit. So, um, yeah, I don't know what to do about that. Um, most PJ gyms are very accommodating and will put you at ease. Honestly, don't worry at all and have fun. Agreed. Agreed. That is such a good point. You know, particularly for newbies. Like the best gyms, I think, are the if you're in the UK, I would highly recommend going. Well, it, I can't. I can't say actually because I don't know. But where you are, but. Um, I look for BJJ places that do like an intro role, like an intro introduction to BJJ. I think those are really beneficial. Unfortunately, my BJJ place doesn't do that. And, and it's, um, I actually said it to them the other day and I was like, you guys should have an introduction class 
on top of um, just fundamentals because I think it's really beneficial. Like when I first turned up, I literally knew nothing. That's another thing I would recommend is even just go onto YouTube and have a watch of some of the basic positions. So understanding like mount, side control, close guard, um, half guard, things like that, just because if you're familiar with those terms and the objectives behind those terms, so like if you're on the bottom, like, okay, my objective is to get this person off me. I know it sounds really simple, but at the t I mean, I literally went in there going, okay, so you're on top of me. Like now, what am I meant to do? I'm meant to get you off. Okay. But how? And so in the fundamental class I went to, we weren't talking about that. So I just was like, oh my God, I don't even know what the objective is here. I just feel really silly. So I recommend just doing a little bit of YouTube research on like basic positions in jujitsu, how to get out of them, how to get into them. And even if you don't retain that information and you can't do it, it'll still be beneficial. Okay. Um, okay. I'm going to read some of the questions that have just come up on this. I'll do three more questions. How about that? Three more questions. All right. How, oh, one of the questions that I keep getting is how old am I? I'm 32. I was born in 1987. <clears throat> um, okay. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Fresh questions. Fresh questions. Here we go. We've got one here. How is life in Australia? I've been moving. I'm thinking of moving to Australia. I'm from Switzerland. Well, you're going to love it because <laughs> the weather's definitely better. <laughs> Maybe not so much in the summer. It depends on what you think. Actually, do you know what? There's no such thing as bad weather. Okay. I'm going to say that. It's just weather. So I'm going to say that. But it obviously can get a bit intense at times. We, can, we, can't, we can't disagree that we love blue days versus like gray rainy days, particularly if they're like back to back. Um, the reason I'm getting into this position is because um, I just thought so life in Australia is absolutely amazing It is uh, probably I would say I've lived in a lot of different places around the world I would say that Australia has the best quality of life um, The only thing is is that if you are brown <laughs> or darker um, You may find it confronting at times um, It's not like aggressively racist in your face. There's like subtle racism Trevor Noah does a really great uh, skit on this where he taught it's, it's not a skit. It's just it's basically Observational comedy, but it's not even comedy really he, but it is you kind of laugh because you feel awkward But he talks about the difference between racism in Australia and racism in the US And he said that in the US it's so blatant like he said that he was waiting in line and someone literally turned around and was like how the hell can this n-word afford a, a first-class flight on this plane um, and he was like, well, I can, and I will. <laughs> and so that's like blatant in your face racism, someone turning around and being aggressive. And then he talks about, and it obviously does it in a much funnier way. So I'm sorry for ruining this, but anyway, the, the, he talks about in Australia, is it just a really good way to understand what it is to be Brown in Australia? But basically he turns around or any ethnicity that isn't <laughs> white Australian and he turns around, so, uh, he gets to the gets to the line and gives his um, his first class ticket uh, to the air hostesses and then they look down at the ticket, then they look at him, then they look at the name on the on the passport, then they look back at him, then they look at the name, then they call over their manager, the manager comes over and they're looking, they look back at him and they're like, okay, and they do a few checks and they're like, okay, cool. And that's what it's like. It's like, it's so silent and insidious. And it's how I feel sometimes if I'm not dressed pristinely and I walk into an expensive shop, I feel like I have to keep my hands out, <laughs> like ready. Like I'm not stealing by the way, I'm just looking. Um, and my mom, for my mom, who's much darker than me, um, it's even worse. So there's real subtle racism in Australia and it can sometimes be even worse because it's kind of gaslighty. Like in the sense that it feels like you're going a bit crazy. You're like, am I being paranoid or is this person fucking racist? And more than not, they're just racist and they have a lot of prejudice. Um, but other times they're not, or other times it's like, there's like a curiosity there. Cause they're like, Whoa, brown person. And there does not hate, but it's still like, Oh, difference. And that's okay too. I understand un like seeing a difference and being like, I have different colored skin to you. Like, Let's acknowledge the differences, but yeah, it can be a bit confronting. That's the only difference that I would say, but otherwise I freaking love it. <laughs> All right. The reason I was standing up <laughs> is because Jim and Henry <laughs> um, has messaged and I realized 
<laughs> I realized what up it oh, oh I, I want to say hello to all of you okay so the other reason I stood up is because I'm going to talk about push-ups so my friend Jim and Henry who hair products amazing hair products by the way um, these bad boys <laughs> this is a sample by the way this is not how big she makes these but anyway she makes amazing products um, but she messaged me the other day about push-ups and she was like, can you check my push-ups and tell me if they're okay? And they were great. They were great. The only thing that was is that there was a little bit of a disconnect from her core um, maintaining this sort of position in the push-up. And it's the hardest part of the push-up, by the way, is that. So she was in this kind of position doing the push-up. The two things were happening as well. Her shoulders were dropping down like that. Can you see that? So... When this starts to happen, it's not great on the shoulder and we're losing, we start to activate a lot of the upper trap and we're losing this retraction and depression capability within the shoulder blade, which is really, really important. Okay. Important for posture, important for sh shoulder health, um, important to mitigate or, or eliminate this uh, impingement sort of pain happening. So we need to be able to retract and depress. So retraction is like this, pulling them back. Depression is pulling the, sh the scapula down. So we want both. So in a push-up, we want to be able to maintain that. We want active pulling back as we're also working the pecs and your arms. So as you come down through the push-up, this is the hardest part, honestly, it's very, very difficult, is trying to maintain that rather than going into that. But it's worth working on. Okay, so don't go as low and work on holding the shoulder blades in that position and make sure you're doing your retraction stuff, pulling stuff. Okay, the other thing is this core stability. So when you're in this position and you come down through a push-up, you're making it, when your butt stays up in the air, you're obviously making it a lot easier. But to really train your core and make it a core movement, core being um, spinal stabilizers and I argue pelvic stabilizers as well. So you wanna activate your glutes and draw the stomach in, pull your rib cage down, making sure that the spine stays stable as we come down into the push-up position. So that was the only thing that I would work on with her push-up um, and with most people's push-up that I see. Alrighty? And yes, I have been to England in December. I was there for Christmas by myself and it was awful. <laughs> um, Okay, if you have kids, will you encourage put them into highly competitive sports? Wondering your thoughts on having first-hand experience. Thanks for all your posts. Oh, I'm really, Lana, I'm really grateful for having um, my parents put me into gymnastics. You know, I think, like, childhood, um, just the very act of growing up as a kid is going to be adverse in different ways. Highly competitive sports. I wish that I, I was in more team sports because I think it would have made me probably a healthier adult in that I wouldn't have been so competitive um, in, on an individual basis. I think that people that play team sports from a young age have really great um, social skills and have really great camaraderie, friendship type things. On the other hand, for me growing up as a gymnast, it's taken me a lot of work. Now I'm talking about like therapy work to try and like and work with like other people that aren't as competitive and being friends with them and understanding like, okay, we're not all in competition. Um, that was really difficult for me because, you know, I grew up just being in competition with my closest friends. That was the nature of, of the game. So it's an individual sport. Um, as a gymnast, it's like I was competing with the girls that I also spent most of my time with. And so we were competing for the top. So that can be kind of problematic when you're developing relationships and you don't understand that. And so then I sort of took that into everything. Then I was a dancer and it was the same thing, competing for these certain roles in the dance, but they're also your friends. And so there's less of a team experience. So I would definitely say that do both. Like there are benefits to doing an individualized competitive sport versus a, um, a team competitive sport. I think both is great. Um, I think that, yeah, you could argue that competitive sports are problematic but I don't know. I think as long as kids, as best as possible, are having a well-rounded um, upbringing, then, you know, like if you're encouraging other aspects, I think we have to acknowledge that like kids will do what they want to do. And yes, we, I think that uh, it's hard. It's really hard. And, and I also feel like I don't have the scope to answer because I don't have children myself, but I absolutely will be encouraging children to do sport. 
Um, and if they really hate it, then that's okay. I'm not going to force them to do it. But I would then encourage them at a later age to do it when they understood the benefit. So if they're really young and they're fighting against it, I'd be like, all right, I'm not going to do this because that's going to be awful. And that's going to definitely cause some problems leading further down the track if I'm forcing you as your parent to do things that you really, really dislike doing. But then as they got older and we maintained a close relationship, I would then probably be like, all right, I think, you know, what would be beneficial for you is to actually get into a sport. Why don't you try a sport? And they're like, no, I hate sport. And I'd be like, just try it. Okay. You're an adult now. You're not going to have any major like issues to unpack later that are traumatic. So do some sport. Adults. Sorry. My phone rang. Okay. 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 Last couple of questions. I've influenced you to take up meditation and yoga and also your husband in your forties, you badasses. That's amazing. Guys, I keep getting asked about my cat. I haven't had that cat for a very, very, very long time. I had a cat called Frida. Um, I had to give her away to a very, very good family. And now she has like a friend as well. They bought another ragdoll cat. Um, so yes, I had to give her away when I moved to Australia for nine months last year. So yes, this year, last year, last year. Okay. All right. Okay. Last question. I'm going to scroll right to the bottom. You ready? I scrolled right to the bottom. There's an interesting question earlier about how to strengthen your knees. Any recommendations? Oh, I didn't see that one. Okay. Recommendations on strengthening knees? Train your legs. <laughs> so um, if your knees are in pain, it's very difficult to do knee flexion movements. So knee flexion, a knee dominant movement. When we talk about knee dominant, hip dominant, we talked about this last week, I think. When we talk about knee dominant, hip dominant movements, we're talking about um, the primary mover. Okay, so the primary mover. Now, when you have a deep squat, you're actually looking at both of the, the joints, the knee joint and the hip joint doing the movement. So when you go into a squat that's this low, it's both your hip and your knee. But let's say you've got a step up, for example. Your primary mover is going to be this because this... So, <laughs> We have to talk about moment arms and the line of force. So the line of force is like, or the, the, the force itself is my body weight, right? The line of force comes down through here, okay? The joint that is furthest away from the line of force, okay, coming down through my body, is generally the primary mover. It's where we have the dominance, okay? It's the longest moment arm. So that means my knee is working harder, my, or my, my knee joint is working harder. When we have a knee joint doing more work, we tend to have knee extensors being the, um, being the dominant workers here, particularly in something like a step up, okay? This is a knee extension movement. It is also a hip extension movement, but that's where it, so that's where it can get confusing. But my hip, as you can see, this is a line of force, okay? So my hip is close to the line of force. So there's less load on my hip, more load on, on my knee extensors. In a deadlift, for example, so look what's happening now. Line of force still coming down through the center, but my knees don't bend very much, so they're not moving away from the line of force. What is? My hips. So as I come up, yeah? and I drive my hips forward, my hips are under load. So the reason I had to unpack that is because when we're looking at knee problems or knee pain, um, what can commonly be happening is that there's too much, um, perhaps there's been an imbalance of knee dominant versus hip dominant movements. Perhaps there's been too much dominance on the anterior musculature, the musculature at the front of the body rather than the back. So if we look at the back of our body, we have things like hamstrings, glutes, um, calves, we can go down the whole body, but particularly your hamstrings, and this is really important, your hamstrings, you know, they're really, really important for knee health, okay? So if you don't have strong hamstrings, you're going to struggle to have a healthy knee joint. So you need to be doing things that are working both your quads and your hamstrings, and your glutes and your adductors. And that requires that you're doing both hip dominant movements and knee dominant movements. So for strengthening the knees, that's why my first answer was strengthen your lower body, but not just with the dominance of doing lots of like lunges or squats or things that are very knee dominant. Now, the only caveat that I will say to that is some of those movements like squats um, or, or let's, say, let's say lunges, for example, 
you can turn them into a bit more of a knee, uh, hip dominant kind of emphasis. So when you do a lunge that's very close like this and your knee comes forward a lot, remember that knee is moving away from the moment arm, or sorry, from the line of force. If however, I was to take a longer lunge, yeah, and come down like this, where, my, where I sort of shoot my hips back and let my body drop forward and my shin stays very vertical, well, that then can mean that I end up with, um, with more of a hip dominant movement. So you can feel it a little bit more in the glutes. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Anyway, I'll leave this. Should I save this? I, mean, I never save the ones that I do on Instagram, but I'll save it. I just can't imagine you actually wanting to watch it, but maybe you will. Okay. Cool. I'm going to leave it at that. There's a few questions that I definitely want to answer, but I do these every Sunday and I will see you then. Ciao.